Hello, welcome everyone, Tanse, on this day of both sunshine and snowflakes, which is a very Albertan thing. My name is Lindsay Whitson, and on behalf of the Kewen Library and Kew Watson Indigenous Centre, I'm thrilled to welcome everyone here today, including our many teachers and students from Edmonton, Elk Island, Ashmont, Masquachies, St. Paul, Wainwright, and beyond. We have been thinking of today as a second half of our film screening event and hope that most of you have been able to watch in advance the exciting new documentary from the bush to the plate decolonizing our diets. I was struck by how this beautiful film reminds us that our living relationships extend far beyond people alone, that we are in relationship too with the natural world and all that it comprises. It nourishes us, it teaches us, and in turn, we hold responsibilities to listen, to learn, appreciate, and caretake with our mind, body, heart, and spirit. As part of this relationship, I would like to acknowledge myself as a settler residing in a Miskwachewaskagan, Edmonton, in Treaty 6 territory. This land has been gathered and lived upon since time immemorial by many Indigenous peoples. I honour the living histories, the languages, ceremonies and cultures of the First Nations, Métis and Inuit who call this territory home. This includes the Cree, the Blackfoot, the Nakota Sioux, the Iroquois, the Dene, the Ojibwe, Soto, Anishinaabe, and many others. The First People's connection to the land, which comes through so powerfully in this film, really teaches us about our inherent responsibility to respect and protect Mother Earth. This afternoon, I am thrilled to have with me six speakers who participated in the making of From the Bush to the Plate. Directors Barbara Dumigan-Jackson and Lyndon Sungeons, Elder Joe Cardinal, Knowledge Keeper Stan Hool and his son Cale Hool, and cinematographer Ral Bott. To start, I'm going to introduce each one of our speakers and ask them to share some of their experiences with and around their film. We will then work through some more of the questions that your audience have raised. You can post questions at any time through the chat function of the Zoom event. We are going to start by hearing from Barbara Dumigan Jackson. Barbara is Nehiao Iswewak, Cree woman from Oni Tikis Kwapin, Saddle Lake Cree Nation and Gamio Sitik Kino Sewak, Good Fish Lake, Good Fish Lake First Nation in Treaty 6 territory. Barbara comes from a very cultural upbringing in the Nehiao Cree traditional community and incorporates cultural knowledge into her workplaces, home, hobbies, and everyday life. She has a Bachelor of Arts degree, an education degree, and a nutrition diploma. Barbara is a mother of three, an Indigenous researcher at the University of Alberta, an educator, an emerging artist, an Indigenous rights advocate, facilitator, and child and youth care worker who works with high-risk Indigenous youth, where she shares and teaches the First Nations culture, traditions, and teachings to the youth with whom she works in care. Barbara, welcome. And I want to ask you, what led you to create a film about these particular teachings? Uh, good afternoon. Well, actually, it was it was an idea that I had for quite some time um, that I kind of like would bounce back and forth with my friend, uh, my good friend Sheena that actually took part in the film. And um, actually, one evening, I guess, like I seen some funding with Tell a Story Hive, and I thought it would be neat to um, have a documentary that was focused on decolonizing your diet. So um, originally I was thinking like something along the lines like oh it would be neat to have a documentary on eating like our ancestors so I remember um, reaching out to Lyndon because he does a lot of hunting and I remember growing up as well he did a lot of hunting with his dad and he had a lot of traditional knowledge from just other elders and community knowledge keepers that he's worked with over the years and also with his father-in-law so when I re reached out to Lyndon, I just kind of like, hey, what do you think of this idea of creating a documentary with me? Like, you know, we can write it together and produce it together. And he's like, oh, you know, it'd be actually really neat to do this because I thought it would be important to share 
um, these teachings and this knowledge with other Indigenous um, community members and non-Indigenous uh, non community members just to kind of give an idea of like how the whole process um, when hunting and gathering um, Indigenous food. So for us, like we originally wanted to hunt an elk, but you know, uh, we, we got a moose instead. Um, so I just thought it would just be really great teaching to share with others and viewers like the whole process um, of a hunt and for myself it was a, a new experience as well so like I, I skinned animals I went fishing and I gathered before but I never actually went on a journey to hunt a moose so it was very it was something very you know um, inspiring for me to see and appreciate where our food comes from and all the work that goes into it. And it's not as easy as you think when, you know, some of our ideas that we kind of had, like, you know, you picture this a different way, but um, it's a lot of work that goes into it. But yeah, so I just thought it was really good to be able to share these teachings with other viewers. That's beautiful. I can imagine, Barbara. Thank you. No, thank you. So next, I'm actually going to introduce our second guest. Lyndon Sungens is Nehiao from Good Fish Lake First Nation and is currently a teacher at Victoria School of the Arts. Previously, Lyndon worked in Ashmont Secondary School for 10 years teaching physical education, social studies, and Aboriginal studies. He also worked as a curriculum consultant with Alberta Education in Edmonton and at Westmount Junior High School as a land-based educator. Lyndon is a proud father of two beautiful girls, Ella and Amaya, with whom he shares his passion for the outdoors, sports, ceremony, and culture. Lyndon is passionate about healthy, active living and land-based learnings. Lyndon, to throw it out here, why is it important to you to decolonize your diet? That's a really good question. Um, I think it's really, really important to decolonize your diet because there's so much in foods nowadays, so many preservatives, so many additives. And I think when you get on a diet and you eat a food that only has one ingredient in it, um, it's gonna do wonders for your own health. Barbara and I created this documentary based on um, the need for a lot of people to like start looking critically at what they eat. And I think going out to the bush and actually gathering your own food and preparing it yourself and eating it yourself is like one of the most healthiest things you can do. That's true, right? And, and maybe these days we really aren't thinking as, as much as we should about that, or maybe we are, we're, we're thinking more so about what it is that we're putting into our bodies and, and how that affects us. So thank you for that, Lyndon. Okay. Now I'm actually going to move on to introduce Stan Hool and his son, Kale. Stan Hool is a counselor at Whitefish Lake First Nation 128. An advocate for his nation, as well as for the land, Stan has always been a role model to the youth in his community. Since he could walk, Stan has been a hunter and learned teachings and lessons from his father to provide sustenance for his family and his community. Stan has since passed on his knowledge to many youth in his home community creating a community of hunters. Stan has also been very active in reclaiming traditional hunting territory for his nation of Whitefish Lake. Kale Hool, his son, has been involved in hunting and sports from an early age. Sports have taken Kale to the Canadian Summer Games and numerous sporting events in Western Canada. If Kale is not on a ball field, a golf course, or an ice arena, then he's out hunting and providing. Kale has worked as a hunting guide and also worked in cultural camps in our area. And this year was exciting for Kale as he taught 30 youths to ice fish, fish with nets, and clean and cook the fish, also important during this time of COVID, with many of our people from finding the importance of hunting and gathering. His goal is to start a land-based program for his nation from what he learned and to teach proper techniques as these can only be learned from years of experience. Stan and Kale, could you please tell us about your most memorable hunt and perhaps share an animal in the context of hunting that comes with some important teachings? I'm going to, uh, 
to the Yaha Sinha where we, the, the film was produced. And uh, it was a rite of passage. So women, we got to go up this mountain. There's probably been uh, at least 40, 40, 50 members of our reserve that have climbed that mountain over the years. And we, we, this was for big horn sheep. And that was probably my most memorable hunt. It pushed you to the limits and your mind, your body. And it, it's pretty well what I do to the, the guys we're hunting with to make them men is what we, this is your, where you're, where you're becoming a, a good hunter and what, it's not just a hunt. I've talked with you through everything and it's, we're going up and we're pushing ourselves. And, and as old as I was and Lyndon, we made her up. We were sore and whatever, but it was a rite of passage to see if Lyndon could be serious in this hunting. And uh, it was it was a good day on the mountain. And we were still also. No, I had to pack me on how I <laughs> But yeah, that was probably one of my most memorable hunts in our area. And uh, there's so many. We hunt and fish probably 300 days out of the year. So, but that was uh, one of my most memorable hunts that I passed on knowledge to Lyndon. He was a teacher and he's getting into this now. So, there's more to hunting than getting the animal. So, so. Uh, I don't know how. First time, but probably most memorable hunt for me was probably my buffalo hunt up north with my dad. That was a fun hunt. I got to do a wolf for the first time. Got to learn how to all the parts on buffalo. Um, okay. Did you get all that one? <laughs> First time. Yeah, no, that, that was great. Thank you so much, Stan and, and Kale. So while Elder Joe Cardinal was actually unable to physically join us today on Zoom, he did create a video for us to share. Um, just a word of advice, the audio of the video is a little bit quiet. And so for teachers who are actually sharing the video um, or this live event in their classroom, you might actually wanna raise the volume a little bit in order to hear it. But I'm just gonna share his bio now. From Saddle Lake Cree Nation in Treaty 6 territory, Elder Joe Cardinal is grounded in his Nehiao language, traditions and culture. He has four children and 13 grandchildren. As an experienced hunter, he understands and shares with others the connections that Indigenous peoples have with the land, the animals, and the ancestors. Please share now the video of Elder Joe Cardinal. My name is uh, Whitehead Eagleman. I, uh, I got some questions here uh, I'll answer. There's four questions. First one is, um, can you please explain the importance of the connection between us and the land? Our ancestors were earth people. We are uh, the descendants of these first people. Mother Earth provided everything they needed to live in harmony with nature. We as earth descendants must protect the earth from further devastation. Question two, how can we learn traditional teachings? My personal advice is an offering to a gifted spiritual elder. Two. Next one. Number four, what is the significance of the green print? As a plain scree elder, a green print I offer to Mother Earth. The Creator gave special powers to many spirits or grandfathers, as some would call. The one spirit was given the power 
of the Earth's medicines. Question number five, is hunting different today as it, as it was when you were younger? Yes, I had, I had a good teacher. My father was a great hunter. We hunted for food only. My parents bought only the, the basics. Today the animals are depleting. I hunt only in the fall seasons. So thank you, our sincere thanks to Joe, wherever he is right now, for sharing those teachings with us. And finally, I'm actually going to introduce our last speaker now, the cinematographer, Raul Bat. Born and raised in Edmonton, Raul Bat is a tech entrepreneur who has built cutting edge technology for Alberta's oil and gas industry, amongst other business areas across the world, such as law enforcement, defense, aviation, and automotives. But he is also used to being behind the scenes as an accomplished cinematographer, working locally in Alberta and in Los Angeles on major productions, including as a producer for the Daytime Emmy Awards and for Universal Studios. While these interests and skills might take him anywhere in the world, Bad remains committed to showcasing the people, the stories and cultures of Alberta. It is equally important to him that he hire and nurture local crews such as those who are working on his latest drama series, Pipe Nation, which he'll be submitting to Netflix this summer. Raul may be found at at Raul on Instagram and at Raul on Twitter. So welcome Raul, and could you please tell us what was the most challenging, interesting parts of making this documentary? Thank you for the introduction. And uh, first I do wanna extend thanks to Barbara and Lyndon for believing in me and giving me this opportunity. Um, a little bit of a, a funny thing. I always thought it was interesting that Barbara did ask me to participate in this documentary. And that when I did meet her, I did disclose. I was like, Barbara, I just wanna say I am vegetarian. Um, I've never hunted before. So, uh, so I, I, think, uh, I think they must've found that quite humorous. But in myself, I saw this as an opportunity to learn about a culture that I didn't know about. And I think um, I saw this as an opportunity I couldn't pass up. And especially when I met uh, Lyndon and Barbara and the whole team that, that took us out it was uh, the camaraderie, the, the, the way the men worked together, the way, um, because in this back country where we went, it was, it was snowing one minute, raining another, it was sunny another, um, and we were hauling over $100,000 worth of equipment through this back country where we weren't allowed any sort of machinery like ATVs. So we had toboggans, um, we were dragging it by foot. Um, so we were walking like, extreme amounts of, uh, of long, long days through extreme terrains, but to have the support of the, t the team um, beh behind us. And this is the hunters, the group of hunters that took care of us. And, uh, and Barbara, that, that taught me the knowledge and the ways of, of the way thing, the, the ways of respect and, and, and also what I learned from the land. So, so as, as much of, as I have experienced in the, in the film business, uh, this whole thing was, it just took traditional film off the plate and we were put into environments that were changing. And, and obviously you, you can't tell the moose to be like hold frame, cut, retake, action. You, you can't reposition a moose when you're making a, a film. You're essentially working with high dynamic environments that are changing and they're changing on the fly. And, and um, so it, it was such an honor for me. I, I couldn't, it was one of the highlights of my entire career. And uh, it's a memory that I, I share with all my, you know, all my projects and all my teams of, of what I went through in a positive and came through a better person. And, uh, and also from, from Lyndon, I, I just, the process of hunting, I, I think I gained a lot of respect so much respect of, of how much they uh, respect the animal. Um, and we're initially going into it, I had a bit of fear. I, I knew I could execute in a technical level, but I had fear of, you know, what are we getting in, into, right? Like how is the animal gonna be treated and all this, uh, but to see these guys, like just, they knew the land, they understood the animal, they, 
they knew the like this almost like the science beyond the science because their their, their connection with the land was so you can't even put words to it until you've been through it and I, I think we tried to translate that into the film and because of my inexperience with hunting and in the culture I think it actually worked to an advantage where I had to really like be vulnerable and and show all that and hopefully that translated to the viewer that that's watching this and, and saw what we went through to, to captivate these moments that we did so uh, I do thank you guys for this opportunity and and if it came down to doing it again I would do it in a heartbeat and uh, because it changed my life mm. I can imagine you know as, as a you know a family of vegetarians myself right that, that what you're saying really <laughs> resonates and and I think some of us probably go to vegetarian become vegetarians mm -hmm. because we don't have an imagination of the relationship that's possible yeah right and and it takes teachings such as these to, to make us really think about yeah. what that that relationship to meat could look like and, yeah, and maybe exactly. doesn't for most of us and the, the interesting thing is not a single part of the animal is wasted like literally everything from the nose to everything is used and i think i gained so much respect for that that i uh you know it's just so mind-blowing and um and again i'm just so thankful of the culture and i think more of us need to learn and appreciate that for our own health and well-being and even for the future of this planet right yeah. Well, thank you for that, Ralph. And, and to everyone for sharing such thoughtful insights. I think you've given a lot of us so much to think about. So at this point, what we're going to be doing is opening up the discussion to include more of the questions, both those that were already submitted through the Google form, as well as any questions that you, our audience today, might have now after hearing from the creators of this film. If you've thought of anything that you would like our panelists or speakers today to discuss, Please put those questions into the chat box and we will try as hard as we can to answer as many questions. So just, just to, uh, to get us started, um, Barbara, I was going to throw a question out here about how much does tradition influence hunting, food gathering, and preparing? Uh, well, I guess you would say like we try really hard to like stick to our traditional foods as much as possible and our traditional foods like I guess really define who we are on so many different levels. So I always found that it was so important for us to, you know, pass on that traditional knowledge um, to our children and I think that's why I felt that this documentary would be important so it all depends, I guess on on different families. Um, you know, and different people of how much traditional knowledge is incorporated with the food that you are eating. And, you know, I know for Lyndon, like he's, you know, every time I message him a lot of times, he's like always out hunting or fishing or something. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like I need to go join you and go out a lot more because he's always on it. And one summer too, we traveled to BC and he was like strictly traditional foods that whole summer, just berries and wild meat and you know it's he inspires me in so many ways that he really incorporates the traditional foods into his daily life like probably 80 to 90 percent sometimes so <laughs> that's awesome um going to our chat i was actually going to ask a question of um and this is one that everyone actually might be able to touch upon but what was the message that you were really hoping to spread to people through this film um, my goal was just to share with um, my students. I noticed when I came to Edmonton, um, the disconnect a lot of my students had with the land because they, they're just so fascinated when I tell hunting stories or I'd show like a, a rabbit being skinned because um, I tried to teach from a land-based perspective. So sometimes we'd have videos and the kids would just be quiet and listening and focused. And I'm like, we need a resource and I couldn't find a resource that would incorporate our traditions, our customs, our protocols and our hunting practices. And I thought when Barbara mentioned um, getting this grant from Tell a Story Hive, I'm like, this is like a great opportunity to create something special. And uh, there's so much footage we couldn't include in this documentary. And like working with Rahul was a blast because like I've got to learn so much about his side of um, being behind the camera and uh, thank you for all those 
kind words, Ro. Um, it was so awesome to work with you and um, get your get your vision and your views on what the audience would like to see and the different angles. But um, yeah, bringing this together so my land based students and not even just my land based students, but like my kids in social studies and phys ed could all gain a knowledge of what a traditional hunt and a feast and a ceremony would look like. Um, one of my favorite parts of the film, because I've taught basic Nihiawak, pre Nihiawin to students before was the translation of the prayers into English. And um, I, I always wondered if uh, when, when students are listening to prayer, what they're getting, what they're hearing, and now they can actually see what is being said during the prayers. So I thought that was really important as well. That translation. Yeah, it's really it's it's really powerful, right? And and having that um, that access that that many of us might not have otherwise. So I'm going to go to the back to the chat box. And actually, there's a really great question for Kale. So Kale, what is the eyeball from the buffalo used for? Um, the uh, buffalo eyeball is used for. Ice and protein. And then they eat the white film with uh, protein. Usually you usually eat it raw, not cooked. Mm. And that's it. Thank you, Kale. And going to our questions that were earlier submitted, Raul. So this was an interesting question. Um, the question was, does anyone regret doing the movie? And how do you prepare participants who are not used to being filmed? I think, uh, do I regret it? I think when we were, I think two or three days in and uh, you know, dealing with soaking wet conditions and you're so far away from our, where we parked our vehicles and we have all this equipment, I think, and you're just getting blasted with cold weather. I think those doubts had come in. I'm like, what the hell am I doing, right? And, uh, but I think being surrounded by a camaraderie, it, it just kept you going. And it's that teamwork. That teamwork was just flawless between everyone. And um, so I don't regret that. I think it just made me a better individual in how to work as a hunter, because I felt like one of them. And although my tool was a camera, my, but I felt like, just like one, one of them that we were you know, tracking these animals. Um, yeah, it was, it was incredible. I, I no regrets at all. Thank you. And, and Barbara, one of the questions that came in from a number of different students was why can't you use pork when cooking at a feast? Well, sorry. One of the reasons like growing up, we were always told that pork and pig were just like unclean animals. So we never use it for feasts. And a lot of times many like community members don't use pork. Like, uh, again, it's like um, everyone's own preference, but for indigenous feasts, we don't use pork just because of the, um, the uncleanness that they, that they are like versus like, you know, you look at a cow or elk or deer, they're most more grass fed or grain fed where pigs sometimes, unfortunately, they'll eat anything that's given to them. So. Thank you for that. Um, and actually, this is sort of a fun one. Somebody was asking if uh, one of you would be able to do a moose call. Lyndon can do that. <laughs> so, you're the expert here. Stan, let's hear your moose call. I'll do a grunt. Oh. There's, uh, there's a couple moose calls. I guess there's uh, the bull moose is a grunt, what Lyndon was showing there. That one is, uh, I'll, I'll give a quick example. Yeah. 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 You use that for the bull moose when, when the answer is close. That usually brings them in. And the cow moose call is usually used to locate the moose. You're making your noise, or the cow moose. Usually the bull will answer. But he won't usually come in till he hears the other bull. So your call moose call is first. We'll, we'll try that one out. It's 
sounds pretty awful, but... That's your basic cow moose call there, and your bull. I've never heard that before, and I, I'm not sure I've ever heard any noise from a moose before. So this is this is a really good this is a really good learning opportunity. Um, there's, there's nothing like calling in a bull moose in September when they're in rut, and you can hear like the bushes crashing, and you could hear them thrashing with their antlers, and they're not coming out yet, but you know they're there. It's it's really exciting to do. And, and that kind of be, I mean, a little bit of that was touched upon in the film too, right? When there was the um, the stampeding elk. Was that a pretty powerful, were you, were you able to get footage of a really that, that powerful movement of, I think you were saying maybe 300 elk were moving? Yeah, we got into the herd there and like I said, what, it was, it's pretty tough to film everything's on a move, it ain't scripted, but yeah, there was a herd of 300 elk, they were mewing, we heard the odd bugle in there when we were setting up, so there's nothing better than calling in an animal. When you hear a moose call, the elk is amazing, probably the, the best noise in a while like you'll hear, so there's nothing better than calling in the animal. Yeah, yeah trying to get a shot of those elk and getting up nice and close and quiet was another experience because usually we, we went out two weeks before, made sure the elk were still there and they were, and we're like, okay, we know the area where the elk are gonna be. So come the day of, we're like, they're still there, perfect. We're gonna sneak up, we're gonna go in this area. And uh, we're just trying to stay hidden through the bush, right? And of course, like when you go with a bunch of people, right? There's noises that are happening. And there was one elk that knew we were there and she kept looking in our direction. We're trying to be quiet and we're trying to set up for the shot, not only like, with our guns, but also with the camera. And it was another technical aspect of hunting that I've never experienced before, because it's always like, okay, we're going in for the kill and we're getting the animal. Now add a camera to that mix. It was, it was, uh, it was an experience to, uh, to be a part of. We almost got that shot. We almost, we were so close. Actually, what, the way, what went wrong, um, because we're, the thing about these cameras, they're so heavy, like you're talking, uh, everything rigged up was about 100 pounds. So when you make the camera fly and you get that movement, we have to put a counterweight. So we had everything assembled silently. And then we put on one counterweight that clinked and the two plates touched each other. And it was so quiet, but it triggered that herd. And then the herd just took off and we lost it. I mean, the, we had this like massive setup. Um, but through that one little clink that, that I made that mistake, the, the whole herd took off and, and we lost that shot <laughs> or just caught the end piece of it. But yeah, it was, it was technically tough because these, these animals are smart, right? They're not, you know, they know how to survive. <laughs> They're so smart. And you got that one shot of me like walking away and seeing them all stampede in the back. And I'm like, <sighs> we needed that shot, right? We needed yeah. to get a kill for this whole film to work out because if we didn't get an animal, like, we couldn't show the skinning process. We couldn't show the gutting process. And that's, Barbara and I talked about that. We're like, this is so important. We have to get this part. And uh, fortunately enough, we split up after that. And uh, Stan's, young, um, Stan's other son, Ethan, was actually one of them that uh, sniper got it right through the heart. So it worked out in the end. So, so thinking about the moose that you ended up getting, so a number of people were really curious about, um, first off, the fact that all parts of the moose are used for different things. And they were wondering about first, how long does it actually take to use an entire moose being such a large animal? And what kinds of different things are the different parts used for? Well, I can talk to, um how long it would take to like eat a full moose. Um, usually every year, my family and I will get a moose and it'll last us pretty close to the end of the summer. And that's around the time you want to start going out hunting again. So for a family of four, and that's eating every, I don't know, 
two to three days a part of the moose. So it lasts, it lasts a little while. But as for using every single part of the moose, um, right now we're skinning a hide, or sorry, we're not skinning, we're tanning a hide here at the school. So we stretched it out, we scraped it, we, we fleshed it, and um, our principal here at Vic wants to make a winter count out of it. So basically telling a story of what has happened at Vic on that hide when, it, uh, when we're done tanning it. So another student wanted to take the hooves and create an art project out of that. So yeah, we use as much as we can. The brains and the eyeballs are part of the tanning process as well. So very little goes to waste. The bones, we use them as we turned a uh, couple leg bones into scrapers for the hide as well. I don't know if anybody else wants to add a little bit more to how we use the moose. Anybody else? Well, in, in our house, the moose, the moose goes pretty fast. And uh, we're always getting ordered. Like, I need a nose for a feast. And the liver, the kidneys. Uh, we need kidney fat for, for, uh, for a ceremony. So it, it goes pretty fast. But we probably go, in my house alone, we probably go through about three moose a year. And uh, there's different different times of year. To me, the moose taste the best in August before the rut. They're tender, they're leaner. I mean, they got a little bit of fat, but they're they're not as tough. So when you're gonna kill, I always recommend try kill end of August, beginning of September, because uh, you want you want to impress people when you're feeding them. You don't want to give them the toughest piece of meat there is. I always, I always try to get people to eat the, the moose meat at the beginning of September and, and then after the rut, like January is a good time too because their meat, their, their muscles and everything get a little tender. So you got to pick the right time of the year to, eat, to, to harvest them. So that's pretty well it. One thing yeah. I didn't add uh, to that is that, um, Hunting the moose is one thing, but to witness the surgical precision of disassembling the moose, like that was mind blowing to see like how they knew everything of like how the, the anatomy and the biology of, of this animal worked, right? And, you know, the differences, you know, moose is one thing, but if you're doing elk and other things, like it, it just everything, like the knowledge was and they're, you're not using automated tools. Like everything is like hand, these, what do you call them, Lyndon? Like you had this kit that was all done by hand. And uh, that was just so incredible. Yeah, my knife kit, just different knives for different situations and different cuts. And it's dangerous too. Like for example, if I was to use that knife and you slip and, and cut yourself the wrong way, you could hurt yourself severely. But the, just the knowledge of, it was just so, it was, it was like a song, just watching it was just like a dance, like just so beautifully done um, and so confidently um, and the connection, like it was almost like this chemistry and this connection that they had with the animal that they just knew how to take it apart and just flawlessly and beautifully. And that's what we captured. I wanted to add on just a little bit more to what Stan said. We're, we're lucky being indigenous. We have status rights. And with our treaty rights comes um, a responsibility to hunt within the seasons, but we're non-Indigenous people have to follow hunting protocols and hunting guides. Like November is their time to hunt. For us as Indigenous people, we can go out in August and get that prime moose, and uh, it's it's one of our rights, and it's um, something we have to take as a responsibility too. To, protect our animals to make sure they're not being hunted in late spring when they're carrying young ones. Um, I think that was one of the questions that came in. When are the hunting seasons? And um, yeah, usually we don't go much further after uh, December. You know, just to, to build on that, um, one of the really interesting questions too was, what do I do if I'm approached by a wildlife officer? Is it safe to hunt without fear of trespassing on a settler's land? Well, maybe you could answer the first part. Mm -hmm. How 
ghost by a wildlife officer. Um, have your security card on hand. Um, if you learn anything in school from outdoor ed, they show you a little bit of gun safety. Take that into acknowledgement and you just listen and answer questions and not be rude. They're doing your job. And yeah. And um, the second part is it safe to hunt without fear trespassing on settlers' land? Well, that's a tough one. Every year we're losing our, our rights to hunt, like our areas to hunt. Um, the government imposes new laws on where you can hunt lease land, private land. It used to be crown land, lease land we could go. Now they're taking our hunting areas away from us more and more. So that's pretty tough. And uh, we're having a lot of the, the young guys that are getting into hunting, they don't know all the rules because it's changing every every year. Some new bill is passed from from the province, and like I said, they're deteriorating our hunting and fishing area. So that's pretty tough. And you get lit and bought it up. You get a lot of people that get upset because we can hunt year round. And like there was a. Uh, I've been helping a lady. When COVID came, the, the, you guys seen it, the store, the store shelves were getting depleted, the grocery stores, and, and there was a hunting, two hunters that went hunting our, in our area and where we hunt. My kids hunt there, a lot of our band members, and uh, fortunately they were murdered last year. And like, it's not safe everywhere. We get, you get chased, you get people, this is my territory, and you got to really know how to talk to people and try to avoid, because there's a lot of confrontation in the hunting world there, so, and there's a lot of prejudice against the native people, like, you get to hunt year-round, like I said, and there's a lot of, it's, it stirs the pot quite a bit there, so, you got to really watch where you go, and who you're with now and it's, it ain't it ain't the same anymore so i yeah. think we need to teach a course to our uh to our youth about what's safe out there and where we can go because it's changing every year so basically that's the most. yeah it comes down to knowing your rights your responsibilities the laws and being able to navigate two different worlds as well. So that's why it's always great to have a hunting party, right? We've had an elder, Stan was our guide, right? And then a lot of people that didn't hunt came with us on this trip, but we filled them in with all the safety protocols and guidelines. And yeah, we made sure we, uh, we did things right. We reached out to the conservation officer before we went into Yaha Tinda. Even though that's our traditional hunting territory, we still had to make sure we let people know that we were heading in there just so nothing, nothing would happen. And it was good. Everything worked out well. Yeah. So Barbara, maybe you could speak to this one, um, but how can I educate myself? So a student asked, how can I educate myself further about um, my Indigenous traditions? Well, for me, I always find that reaching out to Indigenous elders and knowledge keepers in the community is always really helpful. And I know when you're living in the urban cities, it's sometimes difficult to find those resources and those connections. So um, I know even like Indigenous instructors, like Lyndon himself, like I know he's taught like Aboriginal studies in Cree, but there's also Indigenous professors. And right now, I guess with COVID and a lot of things are done virtually, I noticed that there are a lot of workshops and a lot of online sessions like around traditional Additional knowledge and teachings so there's also that and we have books and the internet but um yeah like so there are organizations in the urban areas and in the first nation communities and towns that can connect you to those resources yeah no that's really important um one thing that was asked actually in the chat and maybe each of you could weigh in on this but what is your favorite traditional food <clears throat> Mm 
Moose, I like moose, moose no moose. soup. Moose no soup nice. tastes like the most tenderest piece of moose meat because it's so soft and yeah, that's that's a delicacy. Mine probably fish boiled or fried. Tastes great. And yeah, mine's moose. I agree with Lynn that moose is probably the best meat there is out there. Yeah, growing up for me, I used to uh, love rabbit soup, but I uh, recently, like I, I we had some rabbit soup done, but I just, uh, I'm like, oh, I don't know if I'm a big fan of rabbit soup any <laughs> anymore, but growing up, I really loved rabbit soup, yeah. My daughter, when she was about three, we were having rabbit soup and she was eating the head of the rabbit and eating all the meat off of it. And uh, I got a picture of her with the, the head of the rabbit. And now she's like, why, why would I do that? We haven't had rabbit soup for a long time. So got to go get some rabbits in, in the fall. The, the guy has been running a, a land-based teaching course. And the biggest thing I, you got to teach the people now is like most of them, oh, look at that, the rabbit or this. And like a lot of the young kids are, they never seen it. It's proper cooking. Every, every, there's a proper way to cook and that's the biggest thing of keeping this thing going and learning how to cook cook right the proper way and proper gathering how to keep the meat right so it tastes good so that's the biggest thing and all the wild meat is good if there's a certain way all the time so you kind of become a good cook over the years when you're I think we're good cooks back with me and my boys, but we're always trying. You got to impress the young, the people that are going to eat it. You don't want, you don't want a bad recipe and they'll never eat it again. So that's a big thing. Yeah, fried deer meat is amazing. Um, battered uh, pickerel is like one of my favorite and perch. But like Stan was saying earlier, there's certain times of years too when you get your animal. If you get an animal in rut, like you can taste the rut in the meat. So yeah, you gotta pick and choose the time of the year. Like when it's really cold out, ice fishing, like that's when I find the fish tastes the best. Raul, have you ever had moose meat? No? I, I haven't. I, you know, I was so tempted though at that moment. I was like, you know what? If I was ever gonna try meat, this would be the time to do it. And uh and then you pulled out that, uh, the heart and you gave it to John and I, my audio guy. And, uh, you're like, here, take this home. <laughs> and I was, you know, I was tempted if that was the time I was going to do it. That was the time I was going to do it. Uh, and we're having the liver. Like my daughter was cooking the liver over the fire. Yeah. And, uh, I thought she would have had some then, but, uh, the irony of yeah. vegetarian shooting, uh, hunting. <laughs> yeah. It was a learning experience for me. And Lyndon also makes really good moose chili. Just <laughs> FYI, everyone can go over to his house. He makes good moose chili. <laughs> Do you have a recipe to post? To be honest, I just throw in whatever I have in a cupboard and add some spices and it's great. <laughs> I think that's the best cooking, isn't it? So Rel, actually thinking about um, uh, prospective cinematographers amongst us, so how long did this movie take to complete and what was the budget? I think we were filming over how many days? Like we went out, well, we filmed that weekend, multiple weekends. Would you say like 10 days of filming? I'd say approximately. And then editing was like, cause we had so much footage. Like we could have made this thing two and a half hours long, but we had to get to the point. And, uh, and initially our submission was 30 minutes, but tell us, loved it so much that they allowed us 50 45 minutes and we're doing another recut which is going to be over an hour long um just to add some missing footage that, that we're missing uh the budget you can't put a price on it like it was i think it was a passion for all of us like if we were to count the dollars in it if it was a team that you know with, with barbara's knowledge and linden's knowledge and, and everyone involved like i would say this thing like it, it, if a team team was to go out, it'd be a couple hundred grand for sure, like for what we went through. But 
it, it was a month. It was an education for all of us and we were all passionate. Um, and again, I took more from it than, than, than you know, the, the cost of what, what this would take. Um, and the connection I have, I'll never forget, right? Because I'm connected with these guys for the rest of my life. And, uh, and, and, and sometimes to tell a story and to create art, there's no value to that. It's an artist does it to evoke emotion and artist, artist does it for the reaction and for the audience. And that's payment enough for an artist, so. Yeah, that's very true. So you're gonna do our next film for free then? <laughs> Just for <Absolutely>. the art. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've been thinking about that heart so that you provided me from the, from the moose, right? I, I may dabble in that. <laughs> no, your your knowledge and your input and your vision and your creativity, your your art is a craft and you're wonderful at, at it. And, and Stan too, like the way he reads the land and teaches and shares was amazing because Stan was actually there when I, I shot my first moose. He was there when I shot my first elk. And like he was talking about earlier, he was there when I got my first ram. And uh, yeah, it, it is a rite of passage. And uh, it was really, really nice. And it was meaningful to do that with my dad and him. And uh, yeah, now, now I provide for my family. So maybe as a final question, what would, what would be a takeaway that you all would hope for both Indigenous and settlers alike to take away from, from watching this beautiful documentary? For, uh, is that uh, to my question or Lyndon, do you want to take Or maybe to everyone, just throwing that out there to everyone. The takeaway I would hope people walk away with is just like, what a beautiful, respectful culture we have as Indigenous people. Um, the reciprocity that's shown, um, there was a question like, why do we offer tobacco? We offer tobacco to the creator to give thanks, to have a successful hunt. And then after we get an animal, we also give thanks to that animal and to Mother Earth for providing us sustenance to our family. So um, the takeaway is like, hey, there, there's a lot of protocols, there's ceremony involved, but also like we have a rich and beautiful uh, um, customs and traditions, and uh, I just I just wanted to show that with this film. Yeah, that was really beautiful. Um, oh, sorry, go ahead, Stan. <laughs> oh, sorry. Well, to me, hunting and fishing and gathering is, is life for me. That's that's how I grew up. That's how I teach my kids, and it's amazing. Taking someone new every day, like if somebody asks me, I'll jump. I'm there. There's no two ways about it. We're I'm, we're spreading our knowledge. We're it's something we can never, we can't lose, and uh, it helps our treaty rights. Our treat it makes our treaty rights stronger that we're using it still. And like I said, there's nothing better than living off the land. And it never showed more than ever in the past. When COVID came, everyone was worried. Everyone was, there wasn't much groceries out there. The meat and everything was more expensive. You should have seen the calls we had for traditional medicines and for, hey, do you have meat? Do you have fish? Because we always share. We always share. I always teach my kids how to share. And if it's, I can help somebody out there, we're going, we're gone to the bush. There's no two ways about it. We'll help out. And we have to keep it going. So that's, that's my life is hunting and fishing. So I hope anybody ever wants to go this phone and we're there <laughs> kind of deal. So. And something I wanted to add to that too. Uh, and I did approach Barbara um, because after this, my, my show is completed here. I do have other ones and works where I want to do a futuristic sci-fi. And the funny thing is like, people don't realize as our future is very much our past. And, and where we live right now, we're very disconnected from, from what the past and, and the connection with the land. So if you were to go and discover a new land and a new world, you very much have to look at your roots and the way 
like the indigenous and in, in how their their understanding of the land works. Um, so I have a I, I have a sci-fi series planned out. We're incorporating a lot of these you know indigenous traditions and culture and the look. It, it, it's very much if you look at a lot of sci-fi series, like it, it, there's a lot of this incorporated and you don't even know it because you think it's from the future, but really it's not, it's actually from the past. So, so these conversations have to be ongoing, especially if you do want to go into our future, you have to build more of a connection with your past. And it, it is through guys like Lyndon and Stan and Barbara, they are the knowledge keepers and they're young enough that they're keeping all this stuff going for us. That it can be told in multiple stories in different ways that it can entertain us and also add value to our lives and teach us lessons because everything has to have a teachable moment, every story. And, and these, what these, this is what these guys have. And, and, and I, I know it will be told in many, many different forms. Barbara, would you like to close? Um, well, yeah, like, Stan and Raul and Lyndon said it very well and you know I think it's such a beautiful thing to be able to share our culture and a piece of who we are through through film and share those stories and I think it's so important for like you know my children myself and you know the younger generations to be able to to see our traditional ways of living and you know not only just hunting but also through ceremony and prayer and teachings and practices there's so much that goes into it and you know it, it's so essential and important that we keep those traditions and knowledge alive and be able to share with future generations to come and you know I I'm so thankful for everyone who has taken part on this film and this documentary and you know we couldn't have done it without Raul we couldn't have done it without Stan or Joe or Emily or Lyndon everyone all played an important role in this documentary yeah, it was really everyone coming together. Yeah, Barbara did so much work behind the scenes. And I want to thank you for that because like getting the grant from Tell a Story Hive and going between us and Tell a Story Hive, you did a phenomenal job. And yeah, for those inspiring like uh, film people out there, like definitely look for grants, get out there and, and uh, start producing. Well, this is incredible. Um, looking at the time, I would like to thank everyone for joining us here today. Our heartful gratitude for giving us your time and your interest and your enthusiasm. We will be sending everyone who registered for this event a copy of the recording soon. So our speakers have asked to share with you their immense gratitude in particular to Elder Joe Cardinal for grounding the production in ceremony and to Emmeline Feyron for sharing her Nehiao Cree language knowledge and teachings. They would also like to thank McEwen for sharing space in Kiel Watson for the ceremony. And on behalf of McEwen Library and Kier Watson, a really big thank you to our extraordinary speakers. So Barbara Dimigan Jackson, Lyndon Sungeons, Stan and Kale Hool, Elder Joe Cardinal, and Raul Bat. So thank you everyone, thank you so much everyone again for sharing this special event with us. I wish you all a beautiful weekend. Bye -bye.